Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to the seven worst business mistakes I made as a new therapist. What you can learn from the silly things I did. So back in the day as a newly qualified therapist, my future seemed bright and I floated out from the final exam sensing I'd done well and knowing I'd found my calling. You know, I was dizzy with excitement. I couldn't wait to save the world, or at least some emotionally troubled people in my little corner of the world. And I'd earn a living on my terms, doing something that meant something. Money would come as a pleasant side effect, but the important thing was that I was doing something meaningful to me, and hopefully for other people. But little did I know idealism and financial reality were about to painfully collide. You see, I was no entrepreneur, no marketeer, no Richard Branson. What I was was a therapist, and it felt almost distasteful to think about self-promotion back then. And there'd been very little on the course that I'd done about how to actually make money at therapy. So why should I think it deserved my particular attention? So where did that put me exactly? A couple of months into my idyllic new life as a therapist, the flood of clients hadn't materialized. And I was starting to feel a little bit disillusioned, getting a little disheartened and was most definitely broke. But I had to make it work. You know, I was sick of being a wage slave. Before my attempted career path change, I'd been working minimum wage jobs, often several at a time. So I was determined not to go back there. And despite my newly qualified therapist optimism, it took me a year to go from zero client income, although I still worked other jobs, to 400 to 500 pounds a month from doing therapy, if I was lucky. The wolf was kept from the door, though it howled constantly from just around the corner. But I kept at it and slowly learned how to make money through my life's calling. And today I can look back and see exactly why it took me so long to be earning a decent living through therapy. And by giving you the seven worst mistakes I made, I hope you can speed up the process and not have to take as long as I did. So these are the seven worst therapy business mistakes I made as a newly qualified practitioner many, many years ago. So number one, expecting clients to beat a path to my door. And although it sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, I'd subconsciously assumed clients would just somehow um, sense my newly earned certificate and somehow be drawn to my therapy room, as though the world and the universe would just make it happen. Unthinkingly, I'd felt that once I was a therapist, my newly gained skills would be enough to provide a good income. And guess what? It didn't happen. It took me a while to wrestle down my own magical thinking and overcome my passive sitting around and go get some clients for myself. Okay, so obvious in retrospect learning point is this, that you can't be a therapist if no one knows that you are a therapist. But even after clients did begin to trickle in, I found my attitude still got in the way. If I were starting out now, I wouldn't be, number two, settling for fantasy over action. So when I first started, I would self-indulgently, you know, imagine, fantasize how successful I'd be as a therapist, how my uh, diary would fill to the brim with eager clients every week and how it would be fantastic. You know, life would be wonderful, sunshiny and eternally rewarding and it would all be fabulous. And I could see it also clearly in my head. Now, sure, we all need some dream destinations to help motivate us, but too much self-indulgent fantasy can start to replace action. See reference one on the written article. So obvious in retrospect learning point, spend a little time fantasizing and a lot of time planning actionable steps. As it is, reality has now far outperformed my old fantasies, 
But back then, I had no way of knowing that was going to happen. Paradoxically, it was only when I stopped fantasizing that reality had a chance to outperform fantasy. Also, if I had my time again, I wouldn't be, number three, feeling pathetically grateful to be paid by my clients. And again, this sounds ridiculous, but in a way, I couldn't believe people would actually pay me for therapy. I'd feel hesitant to ask for my fee. It took me some time to see that you have to charge enough for people to trust you. That can actually be part of the therapeutic process. Undercharging can actually break rapport. You know, they might be left with the feeling, you know, what's wrong with this guy and his therapy? Why is he so cheap? Sort of bargain basement. Obvious in retrospect learning point here is we value what we pay for. So undercharging can damage the motivation of a client. The less they've invested in therapy financially, the less they might invest in it emotionally. Not good when after all, you know, your therapy may indirectly or directly save lives. Number four, not pursuing ideas which made money. Early on, I ran a workshop on hypnosis for the general public and it worked and they loved it, even though I was terrified doing it. And for the first time, I made what seemed to me a lot of money quickly. And it was just incredible. Early on, I sold some hypnosis cassettes through a magazine. It was a long time ago, this was cassettes. And early on, I advertised a one-day phobia seminar and it was jam-packed. Did I pursue these things? Not really. I could have trebled my income pretty fast around that time. Instead, I prevaricated or felt like it had been a a one-off fluke. So something had worked and I hadn't really followed it up. So the obvious in retrospect learning point here is if something works, do more of it. If the earth gives, then that's the spot you need to dig and you need to keep digging. If something works, go full out. But on the other hand, number five, not saying no to save time and money. So just as I didn't properly say yes to opportunities, I also didn't say no to dead ends. So because of that, I lost time and money. One workshop I ran um, only had four takers because I hadn't given enough lead time after putting leaflets in cafes. Did I postpone it until I had enough people? Nope. I ran it at a loss with just four people. I would travel miles to see a client and not charge them for my travel all the time. Now, it's understandable that we want to say yes to every chance that we get. You know, we want to say yes to all work early on. But learning to say no to dead ends frees us up to say yes to real opportunities. Obvious in retrospect learning point here is see your time as something valuable because it really is the most valuable thing that you have. I would be very careful how I gave my time away now. So what about money? Okay, number six, not using money to make money. So back then, if I made £500 in a weekend from a workshop, I felt it was my money. I was overjoyed and I felt it was all my money to be spent on non-business necessities, which is understandable, I guess, because I was broke. But my progress would have been much quicker if I'd used that money to print more leaflets or branch out into other towns and run workshops in other places. You see, it took me a long time to start seeing my business as something separate from me, a living entity in itself that I had to service, nurture and grow. Eventually, my business partner, Roger, and I saved £8,000 from our workshops. But it still felt weird thinking of it as the business's money rather than our money. So the obvious in retrospect learning point is don't think of money you make as your money or at least not all of it. Now we have a seven-figure business, all from that initial £8,000, and we never borrowed any money from anywhere. But I had to make the mind shift from my money to the business money. This last one is perhaps the most important of all. So number seven, trying to do it all myself. Any real success is shared success. 
I felt I personally had to be good at everything to succeed. I was always confident in my therapy and made myself become confident in my public speaking and writing. But I was never going to be the world's most technical guy or have the best business brain or strategic brain in that way. So the obvious in retrospect learning point here is surround yourself with people who are better than you at the stuff that will take your business forward and do that quickly. I thought I was saving money by not getting other people on board quickly enough. So, you know, now we have a team of people who are much better than I will ever be at a whole raft of things that help our business. They are much, much you know, better than me in all kinds of ways. And I don't have to be good at the things that they're good at because we're all working and we all have different strengths. These days with websites like Elance that can provide workers from anywhere for all budgets, there's even less excuse not to provide rocket fuel for your business in the form of delegated talent. If I were starting out now, I would really go for it and not dawdle as I did on the edges of professional fulfillment and success. And of course, the past is gone, but I hope some of these tips will help you reach your goals a lot faster than I met mine. So good luck. So I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you'd want to uh, hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below this video. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge. And if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And thanks for watching.